standing room only. Awesome. Good afternoon and welcome to a very special event that we have uh, planned for you this afternoon. Uh, one of the things, first of all, let me introduce myself. I'm Dr. Avis Proctor, your campus president. And one of the things we pride ourselves on is that learning does not only take place in the classroom. And so here's an opportunity for you to learn. We've provided all kinds of events under the leadership of our associate deans and deans. Um, I have um, associate dean for science, Marie Dugan, being responsible for having the 17,000 gallon pool that was on campus. How many of you experienced that uh, this past winter? I know this is a different group of students as we're into our summer term. But that was a great experience, and I'm sure you saw some of it on the um, slideshow before. But we're privileged to have Jean-Michel Cousteau uh, join us this afternoon, and Professor Stacy Sember has agreed to facilitate the conversation. So without further ado, let's welcome them both. And, and thank you, Dr. Proctor, for making this possible. As I just mentioned, we just wrapped up our campus trade event where we teamed up with the science department and our students and faculty have the privilege of reading your book. So if you could just tell us a bit about what motivated you. Well, first of all, good afternoon. I'm very, very happy to be here. And before anything, I want to tell you, particularly all these young people, that uh, everything we do at Ocean Future Society, which I created after my father passed away, uh, is to, one, honor its philosophy, and two, to continue to pass on the message. And the future decision makers, many of them are sitting in this room today, are the ones that I really care about and where my priority is. Because there are too many people in uh, power today who uh, have no education, no understanding, no knowledge, and they make a lot of mistakes. And it all goes back to when I was a kid and my father kept telling me, you know, from said, people protect what they love. And I kept, I keep telling him, I said, Dad, how can you protect what you don't understand? And this is what it's all about. And when he left us uh, in uh, 97, uh, which was very, very hard, obviously, uh, I had to deal with uh, everything I had learned and I had to deal with reality. And reality for me was something that I believe, because the public had supported his work for a long, long time, the public needed to know the facts and the truth behind the scene. And that's why, as difficult as it has been, as complicated as it was, I had to write that book. So the facts are there. No matter what the media says, the facts are in that book. And I had to get it out of my chest, get it out of my heart, and that's why I did this book. Thank you. So what was it like um, having a non-traditional educational upbringing? Well, see, uh, I cannot, uh, it's a very good question, but I cannot give you the other side because I didn't experience the traditional. What I know is that as a kid at the time, remember, today uh, you're on your cell phone, your television, your radio, I had no communication as a child. And as a little kid, I had only one option and I was to have fun and to play. And because my father was on the coastline in south of France, because he was going as a naval officer, he was going to the naval base every day, um, I, I had to connect with nature. I had nothing else to do. And uh, I, I will remember there was one telephone at our house and I will always, and I was not supposed to touch it, <laughs> I did. Uh, my brother and I, we were told not to touch the phone. And I will always remember my mother was saying to people who wanted to know our telephone number, she used to say 122 backwards. 
Okay? So that two, two, one, those three numbers are still at the same telephone number at the end of our telephone today in South of France, where my children uh, and my grandchild was born. So uh, it's funny because I had only one thing in mind, and that was to go near the shoreline and play with nature and understand what lived there. And uh, I spent a lot of time uh, in the water, long before my father created the uh, uh, regulator, which uh, ultimately, uh, when he created the regulator because of the curiosity of wanting to follow his friends and go as deep as they were going and stay as long as they were going, because his attitude was, uh, if it doesn't exist, let's make it. Let's create it. And um, <laughs> I uh, was told to go to school every morning when I was a little older, and I had a bag, and I was going to, I was supposed to go to school. Uh, I would make a detour, and uh, I would go along the coastline at the time, which is unthinkable today, be not because uh, of regulation, but because it's not there anymore. I was lifting rocks, and I would find octopus. And I would grab them without getting wet. And I would turn the head inside out as the uh, fisherman told me how to do it. And I would beat them to get rid of the skin. And I would kill them, of course. And I would put them away. And I get one, two, or three. And then I go to school, and I got yelled at because I was late. And that afternoon, I would go and drag my little octopus, and I would climb up to the front of the house where we lived, and put a plank, and I would sail my octopus to the passersby, because they wanted to eat them. And my best client ever was the chief of police. <laughs> Every time he would come, and if he see one, two, or three, he'd buy them all. And that gave me money so I could go and buy marbles because I was playing marbles with my friends. And I was not that good, so I needed new marbles. <laughs> and don't laugh about losing your marbles. <laughs> but, and that's uh, how I grew up. And uh, I will be eternally grateful. And uh, I will continue to share the importance of connecting with nature as early as possible and as long as you can, and there's room for all the other stuff, for all the, uh, uh, the toys, if you want to call it. I call it the communication revolution, where you have seven billion people on the planet today who are connected with each other, which is good news because you can no longer steal, cheat, or lie, you're going to get caught. And that's what you see on paper, newspaper, every day now, uh, when before they would get away with it. So we're living a very exciting time, and I will always say to people like you, follow your dream. Don't listen to anybody but yourself. Do what you want to do in life. And ultimately, once you get there, you have choices, which otherwise you don't have. And uh, I uh, became an architect because I wanted to build cities underwater. That was my obsession. As a kid, whose fault? My dad. Because he was in the water all the time, and he got involved in underwater habitat. And I went and visited some of those people who live underwater. The first people who live underwater in a home, uh, I would dive and go and see them and then come out again. And I'm happy to tell you that my son, Fabien, uh, who I just spoke to this morning, is going to live in an underwater habitat here in Florida for 31 days to beat all the record of people who have lived underwater. Now, I didn't tell him to do that, but he's following his dream. He's doing what he wanted to do because he didn't have the opportunity that I had when I was a child to go and visit these people. So 
I'm still the child, so I'm going to visit him uh, on the 7th of next month because it starts on the 1st and it's going to go all the way on to the 2nd of July. And there will be scientists visiting, friends visiting, a very wonderful lady who's uh, to me the American Cousteau, and that's Dr. Sylvia Earl. She's a little older than me, and she's going to go there with me, and we're going to go and kick his butt. <laughs> and then my daughter will go also later on that month. So, you know, follow your dreams. And the good news for me, as uh, ultimately I became an architect and a licensed architect in the European Union, 27 countries where I can go and build whatever. Uh, but ultimately I wanted to help my dad and uh, one thing leads to another and making a film or a television program is like building a building, a house or whatever. You have a beginning, a middle and an end. The, the thinking process is the same. So I'm still following my dream. There's so many more points I want to um, ask you about. My next question, you talked about when you were playing in the ocean and finding uh, animals and whatnot. Was there ever any fear? I know I read that when you were seven, you were basically thrown overboard with new equipment, scuba equipment. Was there ever any concern for safety, or was that a non-issue? Well, remember, this was the beginning when the equipment did not exist uh, for the general public. Uh, my dad and his colleagues were the ones who uh, started that, and uh, fear was not an issue except that they had learned about regulations that you have to observe so you don't have a diving accident. And a lot of people who break the rules today, unfortunately, sometimes they have diving accidents, and, uh, and I've been diving 68 years, and I've never had a diving accident. Why? Because <laughs> I'm, I'm a chicken. <laughs> I, I don't want to show up and beat the, the rules. I go by the rules. And when it comes to uh, nature, if the conditions are not the right conditions, because when I'm in the water, in the ocean, I'm in, I'm in somebody else's world. 70% of the planet is covered with water, but that's not our world. So I'm a visitor there, and I'm respectful. And if I go there and the conditions are not the right conditions, I'm a wee wee. I don't go. I stay on the boat. And uh, otherwise, I'm very, very careful. And uh, I've never had an accident, and I'm not scared or afraid of anything other than going by the rules. And that, to me, is critical. And people, you know, people, I'm sure half of the people here saying, oh, what about sharks? Well, I've been diving with sharks all over my life. I've been diving with great white sharks who scared people because of the, uh, the show which was produced by Hollywood, uh, maybe making people so scared that they wouldn't even take a shower anymore. <laughs> I mean, uh, we, we're nuts. We're being manipulated. We're being abused. And uh, in fact, nature doesn't work that way. And if the water is not clear, if there's blood in the water, if there's food or whatever, I don't go. It's that simple. But when the water is clear uh, and there's no blood and no food, I can jump with the great white sharks. And I've even learned, and I'm not saying you should do that because it took me a long time, but I learned that on the upper back side of the dolphin thing, there are no nerve endings. I can pinch it and I take a free ride with a great white shark. And we filmed it. I mean, it's, uh, and I'm not a macho guy. I'm, I, you know, I, <laughs> many times where I won't do it. But I wanted to tell the world and the public that these animals are playing a critical role. We all depend on them to keep the ocean healthy. And we need to stop killing them like we do today, over 100 million, 110 million of them are being cut just for their fins to make sharp fin soup. But I'm happy to say that there are many parts of the world that are learning, changing. Uh, California, for example, uh, maybe we're, I think, the first state who 
made it illegal to have shop in suit in the state. And I'm happy to say that the government of China, the biggest consumer, and I, I have a lot of respect for China because the Sha Fin Soup was a special event for special occasions in the past. And they would kill a few shops and it was okay. But now everybody wants to have it. And it's not okay. And the government has decided officially not to have any more Sha Fin Soup at any of the government events which is a sign that they're going in the right direction. But we need to help. We need to assist. We need to make sure that we don't lose those species. And there are over 420 species of sharks in the ocean. Uh, <laughs> I've been dining in California with adult sharks, which are no bigger than this when they are adults. They're not like, going to attack me. I don't think so. <laughs> and the biggest fish in the ocean ever happens to be a shark, has no teeth. So Hollywood has not been able to make a hundred million dollar film production on a fish that is going to gum you to death. <laughs> so as a result, the whale sharks are the most amazing creatures and there are more and more people who want to go and experience that. Uh, right in the uh, Gulf, the entrance of the Gulf on the uh, north shore of uh, Mexico. It, it's an amazing experience. And you learn respecting nature and understanding how connected we are. You um, have mentioned many times how it's people like those, and people like myself, how we can help. So can you provide some specific examples how we can make small changes to have the effects. Every one of us, every day, can make a difference. Uh, I was sure that you didn't put any plastic uh, with that water. I don't touch it anymore. Uh, for all kinds of reasons. Uh, I pick up garbage all the time. Because whether you live along the coastline or you live in to pick up cancers or wherever. Ultimately, that cigarette lighter that you throw over your shoulder, which I call it the monkey reflex, uh, will ultimately be washed down the streams into the river and into the ocean. It's an issue of time. So it all goes, because of gravity, it all goes into the ocean. And that's what we see. What about what we don't see? What about all those chemicals? What about all those heavy metals? There's huge issues that we can solve. We didn't know before. I didn't know. And I'm running every day. And uh, there are people who are coming with answers. So you can be picking up a piece of garbage that helps. And ultimately, as you grow in your life, uh, you can become an expert. You can become somebody who is going to be able to create a way to capture everything that goes into the ocean before it gets into the ocean and filter it, take the chemicals out, take the heavy metals out, and that can be recycled. We're talking about new technology, we're talking about thousands and thousands of jobs. So it's just an issue of focusing in the right direction. I was behind not very long ago in Santa Barbara in California, I was working on the sidewalk. There was a mother with a kid, and he was about five or six years old. They were walking in front of me, and then in front there was a gentleman who pulled his pack of cigarettes. He took the cigarette, put it in his mouth, and the pack was empty, and he threw it on the side. That little kid ran after this gentleman and said, Sir, sir, you dropped something. The guy was so embarrassed that he went and picked up his pack of cigarettes. So that's where I believe things are changing today. And it comes from what you eat, what you use, and how you can help other people. And that's what he did. Um, I want to go back to what you were saying about your son, Fabian, and Mission 31. Yep. Um, I believe it's being streamed live. Is that 
Yes. Yes, it will be streamed live. You can go on the website, Mission 31, and uh, or you can uh, go on our, on our website, OceanFutureSociety.org, where you can be a member. It's free, and not only it's free, but uh, because uh, we have thousands of young kids who are members and play with computers ten times better than I do, and uh, they're all members, and because of that, in the, in the United States, it's illegal to uh, give a uh, address, phone number, or uh, any contact of a uh, kid. And uh, because of that, our all our membership is completely protected. We cannot sell it, exchange it, or give it away. So you can go there and you can ask us questions about Mission 31, or you can go on Mission 31 and ask questions. Maybe my son will be underwater, or not underwater, but in the habitat. Although every day with scientists coming and going and so on, they go out, go out and do some research and literally figure out what's going on with the uh, coral reefs that are suffering due to uh, water temperature increasing due to uh, acidifications, uh, which makes it very difficult for the coral to grow. And all these uh, scientists will be there to work on that. And so you can learn something probably every day uh, from those people. And there'll be live programs, and hopefully uh, you will be able to ask questions, and you will get answers. That technology is available. I, I was in Fiji in 1998, underwater, speaking to people in Vietnam and Canada at the same time. And they were asking me questions because they could see where I was, or they could look at me, and not that I'm excited, but whatever was around me. And uh, they were asking questions about the environment in which I was. So that technology is there. And today, thanks to uh, the improvement of that technology, the prices are going down, down, down. So uh, I think the whole planet can be connected to the ocean. Remember, 70% is not connected to us 24-7. But should we? So we can do that. And again, all your dreams. There may be huge opportunities which I'm not even thinking about for young people to get into this environment. Um, I also read that you're doing a documentary on the oil spill that happened in 2010. Yes. Is that in the works? Well, it's in the work, and it's very difficult for me to uh, find the necessary support that we need uh, from purely from a financial point of view. Uh, we, my whole team, went there. We spent months uh, in the, not only the oil, but the dispersion, uh, which made our uh, photographer, uh, Carrie, who um, was burned all over, and she had to get out of there uh, because of these uh, chemicals uh, that were used to keep the oil from coming to the surface or being washed ashore, although a lot of you did happen and we filmed all of that. Today, we're talking about, what, how many years later? You say 2010? So we're talking about almost four years? No, four years. Well, you have shrimps that have no eyes. You have crabs that have no claws. You have fish, little fish, that are deformed and have tumors. And most of it is due to those chemicals, not the oil. Oil is a natural product. Not that it's good, but too much is too much. But in this case, the chemicals. And the problem is that that chemical is still there. It's on the ocean floor. It's on the bottom. And here we are, you know, forgetting about it and turning the page. The media doesn't focus on it at all. So we're trying to. Uh, put together a whole story about the consequences, because I did a show uh, in Alaska when the Exxon Valdez were on the ground, uh, and uh, I did a one-hour special on the consequences, not just on the environment, but on the people, the local people. Uh, and I live a very, very, uh, very hard experience uh, where there was a family that uh, 
wanted to make money and they went and tried to help and their son was in total disagreement and he left. And he abandoned his family and uh, you know, it, it was, we forget about these things. It has very, very emotional consequences when we make mistakes like this. So, uh, it's not over yet. And it's not a money issue, it's, a, it's learning to stop making those kind of mistakes. We can stop. I have a... And let's not forget that a lot of people died. Right. We keep forgetting about those people and their family. And later on, a lot of people got sick because the fishermen who couldn't go fishing used their boat to go and start to collect some of the, uh, the oil. Well, these people got sick, and some of them are sick today. So we can't ignore that. I mean, <laughs> and you can give them all the money you want. It's not going to necessarily make them happy. So. Um, I have a student who would like to know um, what it was like having a famous father, and you mentioned that the sensations of having your life change as a result of that. Well, <laughs> until I was 16. Uh, I didn't know. It was just my dad. Right. He was a naval officer. He was driving in a little car every day to go to uh, the uh, uh, to his work. And uh, to me, it was just a father. And let's not forget, my mother was there, and she was really running the show. She was the real boss behind the scenes. Right. I think I say that in the book. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. She spent more time on the ship than my father, my brother, and, and myself together. So she was the real captain, I guess. So. Uh, uh, and, and it's funny because uh, Mexico in uh, Guayaquil just uh, opened and asked me to open it, uh, an underwater trail called Simon Cousteau. And uh, it happens that uh, right next to it, there's a bust of my dad. Uh, sculpture and uh, for me it was very symbolic because my parents are back together <laughs> underwater. Anyway, uh, it uh, it became a big deal for me because my dad asked me to dress up uh, and have a tie and everything for the launch of the feature film length of documentary, uh, which really put him on the, on. Uh, on the map, were pretty much worldwide, uh, called the Silent World, and I went to the opening of Silent World in Paris, and I had to dress up, and I went, "Whoa, well, that guy must be special," and uh, that's when I realized that he, he was uh, an interesting character, and uh, I've learned a lot from him, and we'll. Always be very grateful. I have another student question. Um, and she writes that you're an explorer, an environmentalist, an educator, a film producer, an author, and much more. What's your favorite hat to wear or role? It's probably the next day. Uh, often people ask me, what is your best guy? And I always tell people the next one. Uh, I'm looking forward to the next one. Um, we, I think that, um, and I want to tell people to follow their dreams because that's really what I do. And to me, being able to communicate, and I call it diplomacy, I call it dialogue, I never, never point a finger at somebody. Remember, there's three fingers pointing at you. So that doesn't work. You don't want to initiate or trigger the defense system of people when they feel under pressure. So you put that away. And what you reach, everybody has one. It's the heart. And then it just calms down. 
And these people have families, they have children, they have, you know, they have fun. And you can have a real dialogue and a conversation. And that's what makes a difference. And for me, uh, let's call it education, if you want to call it that way, uh, is my favorite part. And when I'm a little, you know, stuck, hot, maybe a little discouraged, I look in the eyes of a five or six year old or ten year old and I say, I will never, never let you down. And which are my battles. And I go back to work. And I will do that until I get switched up. Um, you've, you've done, you've been known as the man to have many firsts. You've done a lot of things that haven't happened before. For example, you were the first to return a Captain Bortha into the wild. Um, I also know that you were the first to lead an undersea dive, or study where it was screened through Microsoft for people to view. Um, can you tell us more about some of your accomplishments? You would being well, a man of many firsts? I, you know, many firsts for me is not that important. Mm -hmm. uh, what's important is for me to follow my dreams. And if there is some, and I've learned that from my dad, I have to give him a lot of credit. If uh, something hasn't been done and I want to do it, I find a way to do it. Uh, we uh, constantly are. Uh, Trying to figure out how do we connect our life support system to everyone else. And uh, we're back to education, of course, but it's also communications. My dream, and I, I have a lot of dreams, but, is to have many uh, positions on the ocean which can communicate 24-7 and answer questions 24-7 to the public. And uh, that has to do not just with being able to use satellite, but it's also being underwater, it's uh, uh, seeing what's there, and see how we, by protecting uh, many species in the ocean, uh, we can start to see uh, of, uh, life support system recover. And it has a lot to do not only with species, but also with uh, the way we treat water, uh, which is a major issue, and Florida is a perfect example where the uh, water temperature is increasing, uh, which means what? Well, it means that some certain species are having a very hard time to deal with this. But it also means energy. That energy is being transferred to the next storm, the next hurricane, the next tsunami. And, whoa, what about the people who live along the coastline? Those storms are washing them away, or we will. will. Well, how, what are we going to do to try to control that and make sure it doesn't go to that point? And I'm happy to say that, again, my son, in this particular case, created a company called Plant a Fish. And you can go on the website, too. And he's reintroduced species along the coastline. And I was with him a couple of years ago, uh, where he was with hundreds of volunteers who are replanting mangroves along the coastline to protect the coastline from the wave action, from the hurricanes. Uh, and, oh wow, it happens that in the mangroves there are many, many, many species that uh, find the protection that they need to reproduce, to find food, to uh, be away from the predators, and on and on and on. And, uh, you know, you introduce uh, oysters in Governor's Island one in New York. And uh, he uh, reintroduced uh, Green sea turtles in Central America, and green sea turtles are on the endangered species. And uh, young people are there protecting those uh, turtles that come and lay their eggs, so the people don't come to take the eggs to eat the eggs, but to allow the turtles to be born, and on and on and on. So I, I think 
to uh, follow your dreams is again where where you want to go, and uh, there's a lot that needs to be done by learning first about the problem that we have to deal with and finding solutions to uh, face up to those problems and, and take care of it. And we will. Now, the longer we wait, the more difficult it becomes. And, uh, but we, we're heading in that direction no matter what. So before we wrap it up, can you talk a bit about, and this is on a lighter note, I know you've done some work with finding you know. And SpongeBob SquarePants. I was watching earlier with my my students. You watched it. We watched it, and I have to tell you. And you came here. And I came here, <laughs> and with my class, and I think some of them are here right now. Um, I had said to my class, "How wonderful for young children to see this." And one of my students replied. I like it. Forget about children for a <laughs> so, um, I'm sure that's been a lot of fun. Well, it's been a lot of fun, and you know, uh, I'll tell you a little story about that. <laughs> uh, first of all, I'm not an actor. I have a very hard time to remember a sentence. But uh, Don was trying to make me remember the address to come here, and I couldn't remember. But. <laughs> Thanks to technology, you made it our time. <laughs> but I, I was uh, uh, in Italy, and uh, <laughs> we had a lot of friends over there, and I uh, was with an attorney who uh, wanted to present me his daughter. His daughter, Elena, I'll never forget it, <laughs> six years old, he uh, introduced me and he said, uh, I want you to meet my daughter, Elena. And uh, I said, hi, Elena, it's so nice to see you. And she said, Dean, not a word. I had to go because I was going on other meetings and I said, good to see you. And I just left. <laughs> that afternoon he came back, the attorney, and he said, I want, to, I want to tell you, I want to apologize because my daughter didn't uh, didn't say hi to you when you say hi to her. And I said, that's no problem. And he said, I, I want you to know why. <laughs> and I said, OK. And he said, you know when you left? My daughter looked at me and said, why you didn't you speak Italian to me? And I told her, I said, because jean Michel doesn't speak Italian. She said, yes, he does. He said, come on, he doesn't. That he does speak Italian, and she dragged me back home to show me Finding Nemo, where he does speak Italian. <laughs> so you don't mess up with kids, okay? <laughs> well, maybe you'll make a cameo on Finding Dory the sequel to Finding Nemo. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, you know. Yes, thank you. I was just going to wrap it up. Thank you so much for being here. As I mentioned, it's really good. Well, it's an honor for me that you read it because uh, I hope that will inspire many of you to follow your dreams. Go for it. Go for it. Never give up. And in your words. <laughs>